Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the AEW UK REIT PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and as usual, if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to Portfolio Manager, Laura Elkin. Good afternoon. Thanks, Jake, and hi, everyone. I'm Laura Elkin. I'm the Portfolio Manager for AUK REIT, um, and I'm joined today in the presentation by Henry Butt, the Assistant Portfolio Manager. Um, so... Of course, today we are talking about the REIT um, and this slide here shows our uh, strategy, uh, the basics of our strategy. Um, so there's four main points really that we believe make up the strategy that we've been running now within AEWU for seven years. So we are value investors and that is a principle that is very dear to our heart, that is used to uh, find mispri identify mispriced assets in the market um, and really is the basis for all of our acquisitions. Um, we believe that being value investors sets up us apart from most of our peers out there in the diversified REIT peer group. We believe that the, we're the only diversified REIT who are really employing this strategy um, to its max. One of the reasons for that is we, because we believe that it is key to efficiently deploying a value strategy um, to be not constrained by sector. Um, something that, that we're, we're quite purist about, um, we love seeking value across, across all of the areas of the property market. Certainly at, at various times over the past few years, that has led us to um, some sectors more than others. Um, but we believe that over a long period of time, we need to have that freedom to seek value across all of the sectors um, in order to efficiently deploy. So once we own assets, um, we very actively manage them. Um, so this is really the beating heart of our strategy, our, our in-house asset management team. Um, we actively manage our assets to maximise their income streams and also to unlock capital upside. Um, another feature of the assets that we often buy is that they have shorter than average occupational leases. Uh, and when I say shorter, I mean generally in the region of three to five years. We think that provides us with a yield advantage on day one, but also provides us with the ability to have some very real conversations with our tenants at lease end. And if we have bought the right asset in the right location, um, then that should be leading to um, at least uh, the, the sustainability of that income stream, but hopefully it's growth and the growth of an asset's value during its hold period. So looking at the, where the portfolio sits today, we think that it still represents a value proposition with uh, low book values in the order of £60 per square foot on a capital basis and low passing rents of £5 per square foot across all sectors. Comparing those levels to the wider commercial property market, they look very low. The next slide provides some high level statistics on the portfolio. Um, and I wasn't planning to pick out many of these, but of course, if you want us to talk about any of them, then, then please just mention that in the Q&A. Um, I would just touch on our number of properties at 37, number of tenants at just under 150. I wanted to highlight here our net initial yield versus our reversionary yield, which is independently assessed by our fund value and Knight Frank. Um, so quite a difference there between those two fig figures at 7.2 and 8.9. Now, clearly, some of that is uh, linked to our current vacancy rate at just under 8%. But quite a lot of that amount is uh, is really showing as true reversion in our assets. So those that are currently let, but where the income streams could be increased. Um, and and of, course, as a, of course, as I've just said, as a reminder, that's independently assessed by Knight Frank. That is not our own figures. So um, hopefully we'll have some examples uh, to demonstrate this uh, today. But the overall message being um, that we still think that the current portfolio presents uh, a significant opportunity for income growth. 
Now, on this slide, uh, it's one that we put together last September, actually, but just wanting to show it to you again, um, because we think that some of the themes here have, have really sort of rung true over the past quarter. Um, we thought that our higher yielding assets would, would look more resilient uh, against the, the, the sort of valuation loss and, and value volatility that we saw in the fourth quarter of last year. And I think that's that's really now absolutely what we've seen. Um, our higher yielding properties or properties at, at the value end of the market, such as those that we own, um, with their long uh, values being closer to the long term fundamentals of vacant possession value and alternative use value. And um, really, those those other uh, other types of value have have proven um, to be a, a benchmark, really, for those values and, and provided much uh, lower levels of, of volatility, more stability in the values that, that we have seen over the past quarter. Um, and. And, and, and that is uh, is something that, that we thought we would see. I think proven by the fact that, for example, at the prime end of the industrial market, I know we've seen Tritax put out figures in the past week showing values down around 20 percent. Um, our own industrial values um, being down significantly, of course, but at lower levels of around 15 percent and our overall values down just over 10 percent. Another point to pick out on this slide um, is the resilience in occupational, dem occupational demand that we're still continuing to see. Um, now, I'm assuming that many of you may have seen our NAV announcement uh, that was released about 10 days ago now. Um, really, one of our busiest quarters for quite some time in, in lettings. Um, quite a few of those concentrated on a retail warehousing park in Coventry. Um, and Henry's got a slide on that asset specifically coming up. Um, but across all sectors, um, we announced in that NAV announcement a leisure letting, um, an office letting, um, and Henry's got another industrial letting that we've completed recently to talk about later on as well. So, um, yeah, just highlighting that point, which is, of course, very important to our strategy, that we're continuing to see a good level of res resilience in occupational demand. Another factor as to why we believe that we're currently quite robustly positioned um, was our refinancing that we completed in May of last year. So um, just in terms of background there, it was coming back from Christmas in uh, 2021 um, that our in-house debt team, who have, have a lot of expertise, um, were flagging to us loud and clear that, um, that yes, yeah, straight away in January, we should be commencing our refinancing discussions um, to get ahead of the curve on, on the increases that they saw uh, or expected to see coming through on, on the cost of debt. Um, and that is was even despite um, our existing facility having um, lasted out until October 2023. So quite some way ahead of the expiry of that facility, um, we took the decision to refinance. Um, so locking in um, a cost of debt for the next five years of just under 3%, um, feeling incredibly pleased with that now, of course, and especially looking at this chart on the right hand side of the page, um, demonstrating um, really what a great, great level that was. And we think a really robust basis for the portfolio going forward. Now, um, not at all to diminish from um, the value loss that we saw um, in Q4 last year. And, and um, I'm about to come on to talk about that in more detail on the next slide. But but just to touch on here that um, in, in times of, of value volatility, um, we think that, that as a value investor, um, that can be a really excellent time to look for, uh, for value and for mispriced assets in the market. Um, that, of course, is, is, has been quite important to our strategy in, in the past few weeks and months um, and will continue to be going forward as we uh, made some key sales during summer of last year, which no doubt you know about if, if you've been following us. Um, we sold around 40 million of assets um, in the summer last year um, to maximise the capital values there, uh, one, of, one of which in particular, um, a sale in Oxford, proved to um, crystallise a significant amount of profit. So really, really pleased with the timing of, of those sales and the fact that they completed at, at that time before really the, the volatility in, in values started to hit very hard. Um, really then opening up a lot of opportunity for us as we then came to invest that 40 million. Um, we made two acquisitions during Q4 2022. 
um, which we have announced to the market. Um, we had actually agreed pricing with vendors on those two acquisitions some weeks ahead of ahead of the completions, of course. Um, and during that time, with uh, the, the sort of news that was going on in in, in the world and and, and uh, a lot of political instability, etc., um, we were able to reduce those values further um, the purchase prices of those assets by 15 to 20 percent in in both cases um, so feeling incredibly pleased with those purchases that we made and I think they're very um, demonstrative of, of, of what can be achieved in the market today buying in excellent locations um, for very strong levels of yield um, good levels of capital value um, and really looking to buy, I think, counter cyclical. So we were buying at a time when quite a lot of the commercial property market was was sitting on their hands and not making purchase decisions. We were able to make those acquisitions um, looking very attractive now for the company. Of course, we have uh, roughly seven million of further capital to invest. So um, we've got some pipeline slides coming up on to talk about the opportunity that we see there as well. So um, I said I'd turn back to look at performance and, and, and what we saw during Q4, which you will now have seen reflected in our net, net asset value. I've split, split this by sector um, on, into the three main property sectors, and we show our weighting to each sector, um, the value change that we saw within the AWU portfolio, and then comparing that to the value change seen in the wider market. And here as a comparator, we've used the CBRE monthly valuation index, um, but of course aggregated that for the quarter. Um, very pleased to be able to tell you that in all of these cases, the value change seen within AWU was less than that seen by that benchmark. Um, so that is a, a, an encouraging start for us. And I think rings to that point that I, I mentioned earlier about um, value assets having less less movement or less volatility than those at the prime end. Turning to warehousing and industrial, this is our, of course, our largest sector exposure at around 45%. Um, I think the point to make here really strongly is that we're still really, really happy to hold to these assets. Um, it was our uh, largest uh, loss of value in this sector. Um, but we are still very happy to hold them because of the levels at which we're holding them in terms of value. So that's capital values of around £40. The, the asset simply cannot be built for that kind of level. The build costs would be sort of more than double the, the, the hold values, um, and that would not even be including land. So really strong value principles within the levels of uh, which we're, we're holding those assets and, and, and uh, rental values um, averaging £3.50 per square foot across these industrials. So showing really strong potential for future growth. Um, and as I said earlier, Henry's got an example of an asset um, in this sector where we have seen some, some really strong rental growth recently coming up. So yeah, really happy to continue holding the industrials that we currently have. Moving on to retail, um, I have grouped together high street and retail warehousing here, but um, they did actually perform quite differently over the course of the last quarter. Um, actually, in our high street retail assets um, in AEWU's portfolio, we didn't really see much, much movement at all. And I think that that really points to how that sector has suffered a lot over recent years. So, of course, it was facing occupational difficulty prior to COVID. Um, which with the COVID pandemic then significantly accelerated. We saw many tenant CVAs, um, values were significantly downsized, ERVs were downsized. Um, I think though, looking at, at where things stand today, um, values and ERVs within the, the high street are, are looking lean. Um, and therefore I think um, there's quite a lot of, of resilience sort of baked into them for that reason. Um, when we look at tenant operating figures, on the whole, they are significantly um, better capitalised, stronger balance sheets than they would have been um, a year or two years ago. So that that also gives me a lot of confidence. Um, we also saw more positive than expected retail sales during December. Um, and I know that that has um, 
uh, really sort of put a bit of a positive spin on, on, on the figures for quite a few of our tenants. Um, Henry will touch on the acquisition that we made in Bromley um, during Q4 um, on a specific slide later on. But but next uh, are our tenant there. And as an example, I know that they've put out some strong figures recently. So so really pleased about that. Um, I think that the retail sector provides quite a lot of opportunity for us because as, as counter cyclical buyers, we know that there are quite a few uh institutional holders of property who at the moment have still decided to to continue with their sort of exit strategies um of of high street retail even though that would perhaps be considered to be somewhat behind the curve um but that really does throw up significant opportunity for us and for example the asset in bath was 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 an ex exact example of that where we bought that from a vendor who had effectively decided that at all costs they were going to get rid of their high street retail assets and when they're in such, such excellent locations, um, is that more than happy to pick them up at that level of pricing? Turning to offices, um, this is of course a relatively small sector and small exposure for us at just under 8%. Um, you uh, sort of might be forgiven for thinking that, um, that, that, that our, our assets have performed quite strangely this quarter in, in holding their value when the rest of the, the market saw value loss of 12%. Um, that's really linked to some very specific uh, asset management movements that we had seen within our office portfolio recently. Um, just to touch on those, our, our major office holding now is the office in Queen Square in Bristol. Uh, which has been a really strong performer for us. And we've seen a lot of, lot of rental growth come through that asset. The latest example being during December, we completed a lease with a tenant at a new high rental tone of £40 per square foot. Um, so that explains um, the improvement in our ERVs for that asset and why it held value. Um, we also have a smaller office building up in Gloucester where the tenant is the Secretary of State um, operating as a job centre. And during the quarter, they passed through a lease break um, and now remain in the building for another five years. So that impacted on that valuation very positively um, and, and explains why our uh, offices held value during the quarter. Just, just as an outlook on that sector, I, I have some concerns about uh, office occupation uh, and, and not quite knowing where that's going to settle yet. I think clearly it, it's settling at levels much, much lower than we had seen prior to the pandemic. Um, and I absolutely believe in, in offices, but, but I know that um, they will not be used to the extent that they were before. And in addition to that, um, the environmental credentials for offices are becoming significantly more important to tenants. Um, and that's really being reflected in investment values at the moment. And and I don't quite know if um, the market has, has quite got a handle on the costs required in order to meet tenant demand there. So I think there's potentially a lot of capital expenditure coming through uh, non-environmentally compliant offices. Um, and it makes me slightly wary of the sector. So I'm grateful that we have a low exposure in a few select assets. Um, we may look for some opportunity here if it's uh, priced in line with alternative use values, um, but I would expect that to be fairly few and far between. The next slide uh, summarises our NAV total return performance since IPO. And, and really just to, to quickly touch here, um, <clears throat> I mentioned on the first slide that we like buying income streams of three to five years. And at that point, um, we can have that real conversation with our tenants and sort of roll our sleeves up and get stuck into the asset management and start growing income and start growing growing capital. Um, it's really sort of at the three year period, roughly sort of three to four year period on, on this chart of us managing this REIT that our, our performance line starts to diverge from the peer group. And we think that's really reflected in that um, active asset management strategy that we have. Um, this chart here, I, I won't dwell on for too long. I have to say the table on the right hand side uh, is only up until September because most of the peer group here haven't actually announced for December. So um, apologies, that's slightly out of date. And the chart in the middle um, shows share price movement. 
Um, of course, looking quite favourably towards ours, which has been trading at the narrowest discount um, of, of this peer group. Um, but yeah, moving on to the next slide, um, showing the dividend yields. Um, we have always been one of the highest um, dividend yielding REITs within this cohort. Um, regional REIT clearly sitting there some way higher now, but I think reflected in, in there quite discount. I'll hand over to Henry now, who will talk through some asset management examples, and I'll pick back up on investment very shortly. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this slide here, it covers our asset in Coventry. Um, you will have previously seen a slide um, if you've attended other investment meet presentations on Coventry, um, summarising the acquisition process here. But this slide focuses on um, what we've been doing over the past year on the asset management side of things. Um, just to recap, um, we like retail warehousing. We bought a fair bit of it a year or so ago because um, retail warehousing units are typically modern purpose-built units. Um, they have a lower site coverage than industrial um, in the sort of mid-20s rather than in the 40s to 50%, which means you can get a more intensive use out of that site through the addition of drive-through restaurant pods and coffee delivery, etc., And they also, aside from doing exactly what you want on day one in terms of the income profile, um, particularly here, they also offer alternative use plays, whether that be last mile logistics, trade counter, or sort of other alternative uses being, being residential. And that would work here with this site being only a stone's throw away from Coventry city center and right next to the station. Um, but just to recap, we bought this property for £16.4 million pounds back in Q4 2021 at £117 pounds a square foot with a net initial yield of 7.8%, so delivering exactly what we wanted on day one income profile-wise. And the line of attendance here are well-known names, um, predominantly from the fashion side of retail, being TK Maxx, Next and Sports Direct. And... It's important to mention the recent changes to the planning use class system um, where they have been relaxed and there's a new use class called e-use class. And what that has enabled us to do is to bring in a wider variety of retail tenants to the park, um, which will ultimately drive footfall, which will ultimately drive rental growth and occupational demand. And that will all naturally filter through into investment pricing. So there's a very good story here from the day, from work, from day one. And as you would have seen in our NAV announcement, we've completed, completed four um, transactions um, in, in the past six months, all completing in December. Um, two, the two um, ones to complete um, were a renewal to next, an existing tenant, on a five-year lease with a three-year break at £15 a square foot. And we also completed a lease renewal to Burger King, who operate the drive through restaurant at the front of the site, um, at, a, at £40 a square foot. And it's worth noting that you get higher rents um, in the restaurant pods than you would in the traditional retail warehousing space. Under the new e-use class um, system, we managed to bring in two new food uses, um, being an Aldi supermarket. Um, we've signed an agreement for lease there, um, subject to works, a new 20-year lease with RPI reviews. And we've also agreed a agreement for lease um, with Iceland on a 10-year lease, which will be subject to planning. Now, again, bringing in those uses, um, it will increase dwell time. People will go to this um, park to shop and buy their food, and then they will nip into Next or Sports Direct. So it works really, really well for the park. And I think it's worth noting that if you had a standalone Aldi or Iceland, um, the yield that investors would pay for that would probably be in the fives, the low fives in comparison to retail warehousing, which where yields are a lot less sharp. So when we complete those let lettings, we expect to see some good um, capital performance from this asset. And aside from the capital performance to come down the line when those leases complete, it's also worth showing um, the net operating income um, picture here. You can see this chart uh, top right hand of the slide where we will be, where once all these deals are over the line, um, we would the net income by millions and it's worth mentioning the operating income because we did some vacant 
the property when we bought it. So there are um, vacant service charge costs, um, insurance costs, and empty rates costs. Now that those units are, are let, those costs will fall away on top of the rent. So we'll see. One final word mentioning that we're also currently exploring the position of the free um, in return for disposing part of the long leasehold to the council. And that will also be good because freeholds trade much better in the investment market and they just give landlords more flexibility and freedom to carry out asset management initiatives. So that's a good initiative to have in, in play. Hi. Believe me. Hi, Jacob. We lost. Have we lost Henry. Yeah, Henry. Henry, do you, can you hear us now? I think we might momentarily lost Henry. Okay, not not to worry. I will carry on. Um, sorry, everyone. Hopefully, you heard what Henry was saying about Coventry. Um, but if not, then um, <clears throat> we can we can cover that off again. Or I know that some people have also submitted some additional questions about Coventry. So. Um, Let's let's review that perhaps at the end. Um, so picking up on the next asset, um, this is perhaps just a rather more straightforward um, asset management transaction for us. So renewal of an existing lease to Odeon in uh, the new city of Southend on Sea. Um, <clears throat> an asset that we had owned for some time, I think roughly about five years. Um, Odeon were talking to us about a renewal of this lease on and off during the pandemic. Um, as there was sort of roughly 18 months, one year left on the lease and offering some fairly weak terms, I have to say. Um, and uh, we sort of rebutted those and, and were fairly keen to see, um, or sort of fairly open minded, I think, to say, to see um, Odeon offer us some sensible terms um, and, and were uh, sort of happy to kick the can down the road on those discussions until lease end. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And they have offered us um, now a five year lease um, at the passing rent um, with seven and a half months rent free. And that transaction was completed during December. Um, so really great to, to keep Odeon in there. Um, and the value of the asset increased 37 percent during the quarter. So um, really counter cyclical to the um, perhaps the rest of the valuation movement during the quarter. Um, if if you've heard us you will have heard us uh, sort of talk no end about alternative use values and having numerous business plans for that. Um, not because we think that current uses will, will fail or leave, but just to have um, sort of downside protection built into strategies. Um, and this asset provides a great example of that. So um, given the location there, and I think the middle plan shows it really close to the station, a really central location within the town. Um, this would make an excellent residential development site. Um, and we've often looked at acquiring in the units just to the south of, of that sort of red blob, which is uh, uh, Odeon on, on, on the plan, um, in order to, to sort of maximise that. Um, whether or not we look to do that going forward, um, yeah, time will tell really, but, but we're really happy to have Odeon in, in the building now for another five years. Henry, do you want to pick back up? Yes, sorry everyone about that. I have no idea what happened. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide, um, Rotherham. Um, this is one of our industrial assets um, and we completed the letting in the previous quarter, but um, we have included this slide again because we actually completed the landlord CapEx um, in the um, last quarter of the year. Um, as you can see, we bought this industrial asset for 2.175 million, um, a very low cap valve per square foot at 26 pounds per square foot with a net initial yield of 8.5%. And when the previous tenant um, who worked in the aluminium construction industry vacated, um, we had a, a, a good strong list of future occupiers. And in the previous quarter, we had completed the lease, a 10 year exact lease, which means that we have more freedoms and a much easier um, route to redevelopment in the future. Um, a 10 year lease uh, with a break in the fifth year to senior architectural systems. 
as I said, in the aluminium industry, um, like the previous tenant. And this letting really sort of exemplifies the reversionary potential of the portfolio and the rental growth and um, that can be captured. You'll see that we moved the rent on here from £3.35 a square foot to £5 at a 49% uh, increase. And in doing that letting, as I said, we spent some money in the building. We spent just shy of a million pounds on the roof and doing some light touch refurbishment works internally. Now, we don't mind doing that because when we improve the buildings, we ultimately can say to the tenant that we'd like to see improved terms. So we can push the rent on a bit more or we'll have less rent free. Or we could, you know, in this example, get the higher of open market reviews and RPI. So we improve those terms from by doing these works. Um, and that also contributes to the capital performance of the asset because naturally if you spend money on your building, you have a more valuable asset. But also what we did here, which is very apt given all the conversations ongoing at the moment from managers like ourselves and investors on the sort of the environmental pressures of investing in real estate, we managed to improve the environmental performance of this building. So we had the EPC reassessed following improved insulation and the new roof on the building. And we moved the EPC from a C67 to a B44, which is a nice increase. And that means that it will be resilient to all the MEES regulations coming in um, as of April this year up to 2030. And I've got a slide on that later on in the presentation. So a cracking deal from uh, for a number of reasons. So moving on to some recent transactions, which Laura has touched on already in the presentation, and you will have seen separate announcements on, and they were included again in the NAV announcement. Um, so this is our new asset in Bath. Uh, we're delighted to have acquired this um, in December. Um, Laura's already mentioned that we managed to renegotiate the price here by 15 to 20%. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, but it's also really worth noting that locations like Bath um, over sort of between six going well back probably wouldn't have been available to us at yields um, like 8.5%. So we're delighted to have bought this really good quality property in a really good city in the UK and um, giving us exactly what from an income um, what we want from an income perspective. Um, we also really like this asset because um, it is not listed and the majority of assets in Bath are listed which really sort of ties your hands in terms of looking at alternative uses as, as another sort of asset management angle. This one isn't so we could potentially if the office is above um, didn't go according to plan, we could look to move this into alternative uses being residential. However, I can say that it's very unlikely that's going to happen. Um, the Bristol office market is very constrained supply wise. And actually, we expect to see some really strong rental growth come through in the office space here. And there's an outstanding September 22 rent review, which we're working on at the moment. We've got a very good lineup of um, well known um, high street retail brands. And it's worth noting that TK Maxx, who anchor the retail, their race rent was recently rebased. So we don't have an over-rented unit there, which is which is really good news. And again, touching on that sort of um, capital sort of um, alternative use perspective, you can see we bought this in at £194 a square foot. If you compare that to where residential values sit in Bath, um, it, it looks very cheap. Finally, Next in Bromley, um, a bit more straightforward um, in, 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 in that we're in a single let to Next, who you all know well. As Laura said, Next have traded very well um, over the festive period. So that's brilliant news for this asset. Um, Next have a lease here until September 2025, which kind of fits in with our shorter lease profile strategy. Um, but we feel that Next will be staying into the medium to long term here. They trade very well, as I've just said. And they also, when they renewed the lease a couple of years ago, they spent a lot of money fitting out this store. So a lot of capital investment from Next themselves, which implies that they're not looking to go anytime soon. As you can see, a bit like Bath, we bought this on a, on a relatively low capital value per square foot at £101 per square foot, which is very cheap given this is a greater London location. It's yielding is just shy of 9%. And talking about so the rebasing of rent um, with TK Maxx, as you can see, this is a sensible, affordable rent. Um, it's yielding is 8.7%, um, and, and we feel that's a good rack rent there. 
In terms of alternative uses, and I don't really want to labour this point, but we do like it at AEW because it does give us an alternative option um, other than the existing one. This would lend itself very well, like Bath, the residential conversion. Um, we've had a look at this and we think we could get 46 residential units in here if Next did decide to go and we couldn't find a new tenant to take the next space. So um, we've got a good backup um, solution if um, yeah, Next, Next decide to vacate. Thank you, and sorry about the IT issues. I'll, I'll hand back to Laura to cover the investment strategy. So just a slide here. Um, I think we've hopefully lab laboured the point enough already, but value investment being at the heart of all of our uh, purchase decisions. And um, we are always comparing our purchase prices to vacant possession values and to alternative use values. Um, we think that not only creates opportunity um, in looking at optionality, um, but also is a significant protector of downside. So within this diversified strategy, um, using value investment to, um, to, to, to not only provide opportunity, but to protect downside. Now, looking at the pipeline, um, we've got two slides here showing eight assets um, totaling around 40 million, which is, um, of course, more than we have to spend. Um, it is also a number that's uh, sort of growing by the day, really. Um, when we come back from Christmas in January, it takes a couple of weeks for the investment to market to get going. So these are some assets that we sort of put together in the past week or two, um, but we receive more opportunities um, each day that, that our team are analysing. Um, I think it's clear to say, though, that this opportunity that we saw um, arise during Q4 last year of a, um, just a really excellent price point uh, for a value investor um, seems to be continuing well into the start of this year. And, and I think just sort of taking a look at the, the kind of macroeconomic position, um, we, we certainly expect that to be the case for the coming weeks and months. Um, so, yeah, presenting a really interesting price point for us, um, just to, I guess, reiterate the point uh, that I think I made earlier. Um, when we spoke last summer and we talked about reinvesting um, the capital from our sales, we, we thought we would be doing that at an um, income profile of around 8%. Um, this pipeline now shows a yield closer to 9%. And of course, that's where we made those two acquisitions last year. Um, given that this is going out publicly, we're being a little bit cagey on uh, on, on these exact assets and, and where they sit um, over these two slides. Um, but let me tell you that these locations are central Manchester, central Liverpool, um, Birmings, Birmingham, central Cardiff, um, affluent southeast towns like Tunbridge Wells. Um, location always being a major focus for us. And, and we think that these assets um, sit in the right location for what they are and make really interesting opportunities. Um, buying buying opportunities in, in these great locations, um, really sort of reminiscent of, of when we first launched the REIT. Um, I think we're seeing a period in the market where we see value um, quite widely across a lot of market sectors, more so than we have done in, in recent periods where buying opportunities have been a little bit more concentrated. I'll hand back to Henry, who will talk to you about ESG and MEES. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I, I touched on MEES, which stands for the Minimum Energy Efficiency Standards, when I was mentioning uh, the Rotherham case study. Um, and this flowchart just sort of hopefully summarises uh, the regulations which are being put into play by the government. Um, so the first sort of deadline is April this year, where landlords are not allowed to have any buildings with units with, which have EPC ratings of an F and a G. Um, it's worth mentioning that in the portfolio we only have um, six um, F and Gs and they're actually only in two buildings, um, one of which we have a short to medium term view to perhaps um, demolish and look to redevelop new units on an industrial state and the F unit, um, we are currently in talks with the existing tenant about doing some capital expenditure on that unit in return for maybe a slightly longer term, which should address um, the EPC. So we kind of feel like we've got those two um, problem assets covered for the time being. Um, it's probably then the next two hurdles we have in 2027, um, you are not allowed to have any EPC ratings um, worse than the C. 
and then by 2030 it's a B rating. So they're the, they're the three key dates. And if we move on to the next slide, um, this will give you a very sort of good summary of kind of where we currently are. So um, within the next week, we will have 100% EPC coverage across the portfolio. We've been working on it um, quite intensively over the past six months. And in doing so, we have managed to um, increase the number of A and B ratings, um, which will expire beyond 2030 by zero to 33, which is a fan fantastic um, bit of news. So we, 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 we're... we're having reassessed the portfolio we're seeing already some improvements i've already mentioned the g and the f ratings where we have a, a plan of how to address those units um and when we have our epcs assessed we carry out improvement plans and typically those improvement plans will be able to improve the epc ratings of our building by the installation of led lights and also looking at installing electric heaters rather than the traditional heaters that we're all very, we're, we know um, which are in our residential homes. And whilst we're carrying out that initiative, um, we will be looking to install automatic meter readers in the property because understanding the utility consumption of our buildings is very important um, with regards to understanding the environmental performance of those buildings and their carbon footprint. And that brings me on to the next slide, which looks at our GRESP scoring. Um, you will see we score very well in the management part of GRES, which is the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. We perform less well in the performance, and, and that is because we have a high percentage of for repairing and insuring single let assets where we can't get our hands on the utility data, hence the AMR initiative. And we feel that once we have that data, we will really see our GREV score improving, which is kind of the benchmark for the environmental performance of your portfolio. And we will be able to then work with our tenants because we will have an understanding of what their carbon footprint is. I will hand back to Laura to conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, I think I, I was sorry, before I conclude, I was just going to add that um, getting hold of that um, energy usage data for the buildings um, and the consumption data of our tenants, you know, does usefully feed into the Greb score. But of course, bigger picture, it's it's more about understanding the usage and the emissions within our properties so that we can report it against these targets that are set out on the right hand side and just keep a track of what we're doing and hopefully be able to show robust improvements over time. Um, but yes, to conclude, um, and, and we have Q&A to follow as well, of course, um, but to summarise what we've discussed so far, um, we feel really pleased with the positioning of the portfolio um, today. Um, we think it's got a very uh, robust basis um, and excited by the pipeline opportunity looking forward. Laura, Henry, if I may just jump back in there. Thank you very much indeed yeah. for your presentation this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Uh, Henry, Laura, we did receive a number of pre-submitted questions ahead of today's event. Um, and as you can see there in the Q&A tab, we've also received a number of questions throughout your presentation this afternoon. Um, so firstly, thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions. And Henry, Laura, if I could just hand back to you to respond to those where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jake. Um, Henry, I'll kick off with a few of these and then perhaps hand it over to you. Um, so starting from the top, this was a pre-submitted question. Um, uh, somebody asking, apologies, I don't have a name. Which sectors of the property market are we optimistic about um, over the next three to five years? Um, I think I've kind of um, touched on that when I sort of described um, the slide on, on the value loss in the sectors and sort of talked around our outlook for each of them. Um, but I'll, I'll summarise it here again today. Um, I think quite generally we are optimistic about the fundamentals behind um most retail sectors and the uh, industrial sector um, and some leisure sectors. Um, of course, uh, sort of caveat to, to that comment being on all of those assets, um, location specific, um, you have to be buying the right thing in the right place. Um, 
generally as a whole less optimistic on offices. Um, so another pre-submitted question, apologies, therefore don't have a name. Um, please expand fully about the prospects for capital appreciation in the stock. Um, so I think that's referring to, 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 to the shares. Um, why the significant gyrations in the share price of late? Um, of course, we have very recently put out an announcement stating um, a large NAV loss. Um, now, I think the way that, that REIT, most REIT share prices started to move downward from um, sort of summer last year, um, taking the view that some valuation loss was coming. Um, perhaps, perhaps there were some um, who, who, who didn't quite have that expectation. And I know that our share price dipped immediately on, on putting out that announcement, um, but has since recovered. Um, we, we've seen, seen some good momentum behind the share price since then, though. And I think, um, you know, we've been doing quite a few meetings um, with our investors and, and, and with yourselves today. Um, and just talking about the opportunity set that we think lies in the existing assets and in the pipeline. And I, I hope that that message is, um, is, is, is really getting through to some buyers out there. Um, and that perhaps explains um, where the share price sits today. Um, the same uh, query um, goes on to, to ask, um, <clears throat> Can we clarify on rent collection percent, percentages um, and has this remained satisfactory? Um, yes, is the answer to that question. Um, I think now every single quarter um, since the onset of the pandemic, um, we have had rent collection in excess of 98%. Um, for the current quarter, it, it will sit um, not quite at that level um, because, of course, we're still some way through the quarter and there are some a, a few tenants, not many, who are making monthly payments um, as permitted by their leases. Um, but yes, we absolutely believe that that will continue and, and that this quarter and for future quarters, we should be collecting in line with those um, high, high amounts. Um, the same question then goes on to ask, um, is the relationship with our lenders under any pressure? Um, no is the answer to that question. Um, we've got a very healthy relationship with, with our new lender. Um, our LTV covenant um, allows for, I think, a further 50% value loss in the portfolio. So um, quite a significant amount of headroom there in the, in the loan. Um, there's another pre-submitted question. Could we please provide some more detail on on when we will get the dividend covered, such as timescale? Um, yes, I think in our, our last announcement and the announcement before that, we have reiterated our comment that we are, are um, expecting the dividend to become covered during Q3 of this year. <coughs> and I'll point out that that's the calendar Q3. Um, in time for hopefully full cover of the dividend during the fourth quarter. Now, in order to make that happen, um, we need to see the portfolio fully invested um, and given the strength of the pipeline, hopefully making a further acquisition there should not be difficult. Um, but also, of course, any further sales um, which aren't invested within that time period will also impact upon that. Um, we also have... Um, quite a lot of letting movement at the moment. Um, also some linked with with, with levels of, of capital expenditure. For example, I, I'm mainly pointing the finger at the, uh, the retail park in Coventry that we've talked a lot about today. Um, that position there should have, have stabilized by Q3, i.e. that um, the costs of doing those lettings should mostly have been um, seen and we should at that point be starting to see the benefit of that, those income streams coming through. Um, so it's 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 those sort of factors combined that we expect to, to, to see us then leading to a covered dividend before the end of this year. Um, the same the same question goes on to ask um, what could go wrong to to prevent that from happening? Um, of, of course, if 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 any of those things didn't happen, um, then 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 that would um, scupper those plans. Um, the lettings in Coventry are now um, signed up as much as they could be at this time, such that some are conditional on um, 
perhaps planning um, permission for, for, for user hours and things like that. But those are not, not significant um, factors that we expect to cause trouble there. Um, I don't expect that that spending the capital will be um, will, will be at all difficult given the strength of the pipeline that we've got. I, I guess there are many unexpected things that could happen um, in the economy um, and, and wider before then. Um, but yeah, given what we see today and, and given the, the position at the moment, we are certainly on track um, to ex expect that to happen. Henry, do you want to pick up on some of the yeah. related yeah, so questions? We've got a, another pre-submitted question. Um, please talk us through the logic, the opportunity you've seen with the latest acquisitions. Well, I hope I covered that um, when I went through the Bath and Bromley slide. Um, but to very quickly recap, um, well-let properties in good um, center, um, in the center of good cities and towns. Um, alternative use angles up our sleeve, um, providing the income and profile that, that we want, um, being sort of mid to high 8% net initial yields. Um, so hopefully that sort of answers your question. Um, moving on to another question, um, which is a pre-submitted one again, um, what is the latest feedback on letting discussions with existing new tenants? Is there still demand or is it weakening? Um, well, I think I think the Coventry slide in itself um, illustrates that there's still a lot of let letting activity um, going on, um, and obviously there has been um, stuff in the news about um, retailers trading better um, over the festive period than anticipated. Um, we obviously also had the the Odeon letting, which Laura covered when I um, slipped off air. Um, moving to the industrial sort of sector where we have the majority of our assets there's some still very strong occupational demand as i'm sure you can appreciate the cost of building um new warehousing is sort of 80 pounds um per square foot and our current book values sit well below that and that's excluding the land price um so that means that at the moment there's still a very much supply constrained industrial market and um, if that continues, there will still be a good occupational letting market. So I hope that's answered your question. Um, moving on to another pre-submitted question. Um, can we please have an update on the progress at Oak Park Droitwich, um, please? Um, so. Oh, and just last in Droidwich, well, one of the tenants, well, the main tenant there um, vacated one of their two units in November. Um, and we are currently in the process of looking at refurbishment options on that unit. Um, I'm also well, um, happy to say that we've already had some interest on it on a short term basis. And um, that would be a letting maybe just a tad below ERV, but it would be a good short term solution. Um, on that park as well, there are some um, what we would regard as being physically and economically obsolete smaller buildings, um, which actually have some holding costs to us as landlord because they're currently not let, so there'll be empty rates and insurance costs to us. Um, we're currently in the process of looking to demolish those units um, and create some storage land, which we think would let quite well. So that's what we're working on at the moment. And then at Western's Distribution Park, again, we have some older units there and we're currently working through um, the tender process for some piecemeal demolition on that site with a view to building some newer shinier units which will attract some much higher rents and we'll move forward the rental tone on that estate and give it a general facelift. Um, there's one more question here um, which is a pre-submitted one and then I'll hand back to Laura. Um, on financial incentives um, at Central Six Retail Park, and they're, they're being, them being quite sizable. Um, just to recap on those, so we've given a, a 12 month rent free and 900K capex to Aldi to secure that letting. And we've given three months rent free and 800 grand of capex to secure the Iceland letting. Now, 
we're obviously prepared to commit that capital to secure those lettings because in doing so we will let those two units do two very strong covenants two well-known well household covenants and um, paying rents on good long terms and there will be some very strong valuation performance which will um easily pay back the money that we put on the table to secure those lettings so it's all a part of the asset management process um what a landlord has to do to um, get a tenant to sign into a contract and and yes they are um slightly larger but then let's face it the um typically we're seeing three to five year leases um, in the uk now and secure these longer supermarket market lettings and the incentives do tend to be a bit larger and that's the same in the leisure sector as well Thanks, Henry. Um, I'll pick up a few questions now. Um, so I've got a question from Andrew S. Um, valuation yields were starting to slow during, uh, sorry, valuation drops were starting to slow during Q4. Um, do we feel that this current quarter could see the bottom? Um, I guess I can I can only comment on on the sort of information that's visible to us at the moment. Um, and 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 yes, I, I definitely feel that that sort of um, speed of valuation decline. Um, is is certainly slowing, um, if if not plateauing. Um, having visibility on funds valuing monthly is very helpful to this. We could see that um, the October declines were smaller than the November and December declines, which were then very steep. Um, the January declines that we already have visibility on um, were much much shallower. Um, and 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 starting to plateau. So yes, based on the information we can see today, um, we believe that that this time the valuers have uh, reacted very quickly, um, and 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 we encourage that. Um, you know, as as far as it represents the market, and, and we think that's good. If if our our values have been right sized pretty quickly, um, yeah, that's a good thing. Next question from KT. Um, do we have enough money for the current period without raising more working capital? <coughs> um, the answer to that question is yes. Um, we um, project out our capital expenditure um, rough, roughly, well, certainly at the moment, because we have uh, a couple of sort of long dated items, um, but sort of 12 month, twelve to 18 months in advance. Um, so, so um we have capital set aside for, for, for those commitments um, quite some way out because we know that they'll be falling due. Um, we also hold um, on top of that um, uh, uh, quite a, a conservative cash buffer um, that, that we, we don't touch um, for working capital. Um, so yes, we very much have precautions in place within the company um, that we always have enough working capital. Next question from Chris B. Um, can we comment on the long term vacancy target? Um, are there any future concerns in this area, given the economic outlook? Um, yeah, so I would say that we would expect our long term vacancy. Um, of course, we don't really have a target. We would love to target zero. But um, I would say we'd always expect because we run a shorter um, income profile strategy, um, we would always expect to have some churn and, and broadly between sort of five, five and, and eight percent is, is where I think that that will always sort of bounce around over the long term. Um, I think uh, the best way perhaps of answering this question is to say that if we look forward over the, the rest of 2023, um, where vacancy sits um, at the moment, um, isn't a, a particular concern for us returning um, back to our dividend cover. Of course, though, if vacancy were to increase significantly, um, then that would start to impact on our earnings. Um, another question from Chris Beef. Uh, are the levels of incentives becoming increasingly more, increasingly more demanding from existing and new tenants? Um, 
No, I think, and I think this really just touches on the the answer that Henry gave um, immediately prior to, to to my joining back on. Um, he was talking about the incentives, for example, that we've given in Central Six, um, and and yes, they are they're pretty sizable. Um, but tenants that that um, national tenants of that standing who have such a high level of fit out um, really often um, demand those those kind of levels. Um, I was very pleased with the way that we were able to sign up Odeon for five years with a rent free of seven months. Um, you know, if, if I think we were doing a new letting to a new cinema, it probably would have been quite a bit higher than that. Um, so, no, I think on, on the whole, um, those levels still looking as, as to be expected. Um, a question from Ray S. Um, are there any plans to raise funds um, to take advantage of the pipeline um, that we have? And actually, I think I'll just combine that with somebody else's question who was asking um, <clears throat> if we would be turning to shareholders um, for an equity raise. Um, that was from Martin K. So I think two, two very similar questions there. Thank you both. Um, you know, I think we've always sort of sat in front of you uh, with when when we have times of, of of sort of interesting particularly interesting pipeline and said that we would love to be able to have access to that um and i know that some of our larger shareholders who have been very loyal to us from the start would like to see the company grow a little in order to provide um them with with better levels of liquidity um and for us it, it just often sometimes is frustrating when we look at a really exciting pipeline of around you know 50 million um a sort of real property geeks um, and, and sort of purists in value investment. Um, we get quite excited by our pipelines and, and, and when we can't access all of them, it can feel quite frustrating. Um, you know, the ones that got away, there's always some great assets out there. Um, for that reason, we would love to be able to raise um, if the share price is in the right place and, and if our investors support it. Um, if we were to do so, um, we would we would certainly think about being able to offer that out to to retail investors as well if there was demand. So um, if that decision is is taken at some point in the future, then um, we we will certainly think of of the retail offer as well. There's a couple of um, questions I can pick up here, Laura. Whilst you have a read for a few more, um, there's a question from Robert S on um, utility costs and the impact of um, those on our tenants. Um, I think it's a good point and it's why i mentioned the automatic leader reading reading um initiative um earlier on um in the esg slides um we obviously feel that that's very important to understand what our tenants are using so we can um have those conversations with tenants who we feel um are under more pressure from their utility costs um it's worth noting that since um energy prices have increased we have um, been looking into um, battery storage um, opportunities on a number of our sites where the tenants have a la larger electricity consumption um, with a view to obviously um, putting batteries on those sites. And it's important to emphasize these aren't lithium batteries, so they're not flammable, so they, the insurance situation shouldn't be impacted. And um, with a view to obviously storing cheap electricity, which is produced um, in late at night on windy evenings um, so it's cheap green electricity with a view to storing that electricity so then it can be used at times when electricity is more expensive um there's another question from robert s um on epcs and um where our portfolio sits within um the mees regulations i i hope that i have answered that question robert um when i carried out um the, the Mies um, slide um, about 10 minutes or so ago. Thanks, Henry. Um, I'll just pick up a few more questions now. Um, uh, another question from KT. Um, is the current dividend sustainable long term? Um, yes. Um, I think I'll refer the sort of comments there back in the direction of those that I made earlier about returning to dividend cover. Um, at times when the portfolio is fully invested um, and um, sort of seeing through this current period where we have some accretive lettings um, sort of washing through a, 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 a income and capital intensive phase in, before we see the benefit of their income. Um, at a more stabilised time, then yes, absolutely. When we project out long term, um, the portfolio assets um, sustainably cover the current dividend. 
Um, a question from Simon J. Um, as more and more retail financial groups leave the high street, are we seeing any attractive opportunities? Um, I think, Simon, you might be asking me about um, banks leaving the high street. Um, we have seen quite a few announcing significant withdrawal programmes. Um, are we seeing any attractive opportunities because of that? Um, generally, that, that doesn't open up opportunity for us. Um, clearly, those would be vacant properties. Um, and, and, and we like buying properties that are up and let already so that we can have income from day one. Um, in addition, those bank properties tend to be um, not not have the largest frontages um, in every case, sometimes be quite a traditional style um, and um, not the largest asset. So so we don't see that as a particular area of opportunity for this strategy. Um, <clears throat> an interesting question from um, uh, apologies if I'm pronouncing this wrong. Um, I think it's Miguel, Miguel M. Um, what are the implications, if any, of the very attractive yields in your pipeline for the valuation of your actual portfolio? So I think, Miguel, what you're probably getting at here is, um, of course, if if we're seeing more, more opportunity in our pipeline and, and yields having moved out, which makes our pipeline more attractive, um, then, then, then does that mean there is further fall to come in the value of our assets? Um, uh, you know, I think we've seen clearly quite significant value loss in our own portfolio during the last quarter. So um, my my sort of response, um, yeah, and where we haven't seen that, I think there's been some quite um, clear reasons why linked to asset management gains. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not concerned. I don't think that the pipeline pricing um, looks particularly out of line. Um, with the portfolio's pricing. I think what we see in the pipeline is a few isolated instances of, of perhaps some assets that, that look mispriced by the market. Um, for example, like the asset we bought in Bath, where I mentioned a vendor that was sort of hell-bent on selling whatever happened, um, and almost at any price. Um, it's that type of opportunity that, that sort of opens up, um, yeah, great value opportunities for us. So, um, the pricing of the pipeline do doesn't make me feel concerned about the valuation of the current portfolio. I, I think that's what, what you're asking me. Um, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, there's also another question from Anthony C. Um, in terms of the office portfolio, how well are they used? Um, many offices, although let, are empty most days as people work from home. Um, yeah, thanks, Anthony. Hitting exactly um, sort of the nail on the head in terms of, of my concerns for, for the office market in, in general. Um, <coughs> apologies. Um, we have three office assets um, in this portfolio. Um, we have Queen Square in Bristol. Um, we have um, the Job Centre in um, Gloucester. Um, and we have a small office building um, in Hemel Hempstead. Um, in a sort of quasi-industrial location that's led to a, a property management tenant. Um, we know that the property management tenant occupy that building really well. Um, so that one isn't a concern for us. Um, equally, the job centre in Gloucester, um, that one, as you can imagine, um, a very busy office. Um, presence, physical presence there absolutely required. Um, that takes us back to Queen Square in Bristol. You know, I think the types of offices that will survive and that will perform really well and that, to be honest, in this asset is, is proving the exact point. Um, in very few offices at the moment, you will see rental growth. And, 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 and those are the ones that are well located near to strong amenity in really exciting cities that tenants want to come back into um, and with strong ESG credentials. And, and that's exactly what we have in Queen Square, Bristol. Um, a city that has seen a lot of um, development, um, a location with a lot of surrounding amenity and a very attractive Georgian square. Um, and our EPC on that building is B. So in line with, with exactly with where um, do the corporate tenants, where, where it wants to be. And, and, and it's that that has led us to see that new high rental tone proved there. Yeah, very few offices that are seeing rental growth. So I'm pleased that we have a generally small exposure here, but I'm not concerned about any of the assets that we're currently holding there. Um, 
Last but not least, um, Jeremy B has asked a question, are listed buildings exempt from Mies? Um, Henry, I'm going to bat that over to you. Um, they're not exempt. Um, however, let's say you had a listed building <coughs> and the only way you could improve the EPC to make it sit with inside Mies regulations would, was by putting in, let's say, double glazing window and that altered the appearance of that building um, and therefore would not be allowed under planning law, then it would become exempt. Um, so that's that's like sort of the example that I would use. Um, there's also a rule where um, you can apply for an exemption if the cost of doing the Mies works, um, if, it, if it's um, basically loses you money over a seven year period um, and you can prove that then there's an exemption as well. So, and that quite often, um, listed buildings quite often fall within in, in that. Um, so it's 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 a case by case um, process rather than there being a, a blanket case for all listed buildings. I hope that gives you a flavour for sort of what we have to deal with. Um, uh, sorry, I think we said that was going to be the last question, but I'll, I'll just pick up on one more. There's a question from Mark B here. Um, to what extent do we expect aggregate rental growth across our portfolio to match inflation? Um, you know, I think, I think, um, uh, and, and I'm going to answer that in conjunction with another question um, that I think has been asked about um, by Matthew P., um, how long will it be before we start seeing inflation increases being reflected in the dividend? Um, sort of taking those two together, really. So, um, of course, we we don't have many inflation linked leases in our portfolio. Um, we have a very small percentage. Um, that's because we think that those types of leases don't tend to offer the best value um, <clears throat> for the assets um, in the investment market. Um, so they're unlikely to be ones that we buy. Um, so in answer to the question of will we see uh, inflation linkage coming through in our portfolio, it, it isn't a feature. Uh, the rental growth that we see is more organic and proven through um, sort of supply and demand dynamics rather than being written into leases. Um, do we expect that to, to match inflation? Um, I mean, on a few of our industrial assets, um, we have seen quite high levels. I think there was, uh, to quote an example that, that I think we've even talked about in a NAV announcement um, during the course of the last year, um, an asset where um, I think we saw about sort of 20% uh, rental growth over a, a two-year period. And, and, and Henry, your um, example in the uh, presentation earlier of uh, your letting in Rotherham and um, fifty percent rental growth um from what from one lease to another um it, it's those type of sort of uh, it, it examples that we will see of of more organic rental growth um looking across the portfolio as a whole though um I mean we wouldn't expect um rental growth from from that sort of organic route to, to match inflation at the mo levels at the moment um because of course in inflation levels are are, are so high um commenting on um will will we see that reflected in the dividend um i think at the moment we're just focusing on getting the dividend covered um looking forward to that um or sort of looking forward from that point um of as a REIT, we of course required to pay out ninety percent of our income as our as our of our ninety percent of our income as a dividend. So if we were in a position to have higher levels of of earnings, um, then of course our dividend is always set by the board, um, but we would be required to pay out ninety percent of that. I hope that answers your question, Laura. Henry, if I may just jump back in there, and thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time there and addressing all of those questions uh, that came in from investors this afternoon. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, uh, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. Um, Laura, perhaps before redirecting those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, I think just reiterating the points that we made earlier, um, we refinanced the portfolio last year and think that that provides um, for um, just one of the reasons why we think that the portfolio is very robustly positioned today. 
Um, really, really pleased with the strategy that we employed during the course of the, the last year, um, timing our sales last summer um, excellently in order to be able to maximize value um, and then being able to have capital to, to reinvest back into this really exciting investment uh, market. Um, yeah, very pleased with, with our positioning. Laura, that's great. And Henry as well. Thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. It's going to take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure it'll be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of AEW UK REIT PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.